Today we're here to put all the bullshit aside and have some real talk about using amps versus using digital modelers versus using software plugins for guitars. And this video might be pretty useful for my beginner buddies out there who haven't gotten to try out a lot of different types of amps or software and want to learn about this stuff and want to know what's going to sound best for them and where they should spend their money. So hang in there for 4.3 seconds and we're going to get to talking. This is a topic that creates plenty of good old internet debate. You know, the courteous and kind and really considerate discourse we've come to know from internet chats. So why are guitar players, especially guys that are into old school amps and tube amps, getting so vocal and very disillusioned with the idea of digital modeling and always call it two-dimensional sounding? Well, there's a big reason for that, and we're gonna talk about it in a minute. First, for my beginner buddies out there, I wanna talk about what these three primary ways are to plug your guitar in and get sounds. And if you're not interested in that or you already know what it's about, uh, you can go to this timestamp on the video or just use the chapters. Number one, old-fashioned guitar amps. Amps come in two basic forms, a tube amp, which if you live in the UK is also known as a valve amp, and a solid state amp. Now don't confuse the speakers with the amp itself. The amp is the electronics in the top part of it and can also be called an amp head when it comes separately, and you can attach it to any speakers that you want, really. Now with the tube amp, the very basic idea is that as the tubes heat up, you get this nice distortion, warm kind of tone, especially when you crank a lot of volume through it. Next came solid state amps, which replaced the tubes with circuits on circuit boards. And the tone generally with these to most players ears, especially if they're used to tubes, is a little bit more of a crisp, high trebly kind of tone, but not always the case, just kind of in general. And of course, a lot of this has to do with, again, what speakers you're combining it with, and also how you dial the sound in with the EQ and whatnot on the amp itself. So that's the very basics on old school amps. Let's talk about what comes next. Number two, modeling. And no, I'm not talking about a fashion show. I'm talking about something I got into way back in the 90s when Roland first came out with the VG8. Essentially, it's an attempt to recreate all people's favorite amps and sometimes effects all in one digital unit so that you can have like a room full of amplifiers and one thing and cart it around with you. And as I said, it kind of started with the Roland's VGA and then Line 6 got into the game with things that looked like amps but weren't. They were digital modelers. And now today we have the really advanced units like the Fractal Audio Axe FX and the Kemper Profiler and now the Quad Cortex. There are others as well, but essentially these things all use their own kind of method to recreate what amp circuitry is doing or the amp tubes are doing and also they use something that's called uh, an impulse response or an IR to capture the sound of the different types of speakers that you can put an amplifier in and the way that you're miking it up. Often these things also include a digital version of every pedal you've ever seen or could think of. One of the coolest and most convenient things about these is that you can plug them right into your USB interface that you're using to capture sound and do recording on your computer, and it will sound like you had mic'd up a cabinet in a room. And you can do it all with these things on, so it's really great for not waking up the neighbors. Um, I want to talk to the grown-up who lives here. And finally, number three, software plugins, which is essentially taking everything from the digital modelers that we talked about before and putting it into software that's directly on your computer. Now, this will allow you to plug directly into your sound card and get the sounds out of your computer, and it's generally less expensive, but you definitely need to understand software setups and have a system capable of running these things well, or you run into problems with latency, which is when you play notes and you hear the sound like, in a delay after what you played. You can fix this, but you definitely have to understand setups pretty well and do some different kind of computer gymnastics to get it to work right in some instances. And the top products in this market are from like Neural DSP and STL ToneUp come to mind. Okay, now that you know the differences between all these things, it's time for the real talk. One of the biggest reasons diehard amp lovers think that these things sound terrible is because they haven't differentiated the difference between in the room and in the mix. You see, when you have a traditional amplifier or amp head, it's combined with these big 12 inch speakers often, there's two of them or four of them in a cabinet, and when you crank it up and play, you can actually feel it push the air. This is a very fun and visceral feeling. And by the way, the cabinets, 
the wood in the cabinets for the speakers can also take away some of that high, scratchy, kind of unpleasant tone, and this is often perceived as warmth. The problem is that this tone that you love hearing in the room and can feel is not what you capture in a mix. You've put a mic up to the cabinet and you're sending it either to tape or the computer, however you're recording. It's not the same thing as what you hear in the room, nor would you want it to be because that signal then would have way too much going on, especially in the low end, and would compete with all the other instruments and kind of eat up the track and not sound good in a mix. What you hear in a room was direct from the amp to your ears. What you hear in a mix was interpolated through a microphone and then EQ'd and compressed however it was to fit in the puzzle pieces that are an entire mix of a song. Now you can take one of these fancy new devices, a digital modeler, stick it on top of a cabinet just like an amp head, and you would have to turn off any cabinet emulation that's built into it. And a lot of them don't have enough uh, output in the signal that you would use it directly with a cabinet like that. So you would also have to put a power amp in the chain. But the end result would be the same type of thing you would get putting an amp head on top of it. And so if you have a great profile or model of an amp that you love, it's going to sound great in the room too. That's really not what these things were made for though. Yes, the one great strength of using modelers or a profiler is that you have hundreds of amps and thousands of cabinets and a room full of pedals all at your disposal in one box. But the other thing is that you can capture the sound of miking it up and getting a good recording signal out of it and go directly in your computer with that without having to fuss with figuring out how to mic it or spend money on mics or get the right kind of room to put that cabinet in to get that great sound onto your recording. And again, that is because of the IRs or the impulse responses that if you didn't have them, your tone would sound scratchy and awful. <laughs> So if you're a home project musician, it's really a blessing to be able to get that great recorded kind of sound that you can get by cranking up amps and recording them in a room. And you don't even have to go out and get one of those expensive attenuators to kind of do that with an amp. It's all included in the digital modeling. Now, what if you're a budget and want all those cool modeling type options, but don't have the 1500, 2000, even $3,000 to spend on something like a Kemper, Axe FX, or Quad Cortex? That's where software plugins come in. Software plugins try to do what that expensive hardware does, and definitely when that software first started coming out, those first few pieces of software sounded pretty crummy, and they definitely were two-dimensional. But, you know, they were what they were, and sometimes that inspires you to make a sound or make a song in and of itself. But as time went by, and companies like I mentioned before, Neural DSP and STL Tone came along, uh, the software started to sound a lot better. These type of plugins will definitely get you where you need to go if you're on a budget. And the only thing you're really dealing with here, again, is the issue of latency because the computer is doing all of the processing rather than having it on board with a separate unit. But it's something that you can definitely get around if you set things up correctly. Now, a quick note on that, when you're looking at latency, it's usually measured in milliseconds. How many milliseconds after you play the note is it actually being heard through the speakers or onto your headphones? And in my experience, Anything over about 15 milliseconds is going to be almost too difficult to play and it's going to affect how you play. Once you get it down below 15, it becomes better. And if you want it to feel and sound more organic, you definitely want it closer to eight milliseconds. Anything less than that, or excuse me, anything more than that, a number where you have a more of a problem with latency can start to feel like uh, not natural when you're playing and even if you can't actually hear the difference in the latency from the note that you're playing to the sound that's heard it doesn't feel quite right and you can't figure out why so again shoot for about eight milliseconds if you're going to use a piece of software and you want to get the latency as low as you can and sounding good and so that's what all three of these things are about in the broadest of strokes the thumbnail of my video says the truth about these and basically what i'm trying to say here is that no one is empirically better than another if you like how something sounds and you can create music with it and it inspires music for you and that's good enough for you, and that's all that you need. Don't let a stodgy amp groupie tell you that something's better than another. And of course, always be open to trying new things, old things, whatever that might be. But if you like it better, that's enough. Now, if you wanna hear a bunch of examples of the Axe Effects versus the Kemper, I have a whole Gear Battles playlist. I'll include the link for that below in the description. I also have a video where I face off software, the STL Tone Hub versus Neural DSP. Again, I'll include all the links for buying any of these things and some of the videos that are relevant to it that I've posted here. And as always, if there's anything further you'd like me to cover, any questions that you have, let me know in the comments below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And until next time, guys, keep making great music. Hey friends, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. It makes the whole world better.